Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We hope that you are having a great Thanksgiving weekend. We start tonight with a growing county and its executive on the job for just under a year. Macomb County Exec Mark Hackle has had a few skirmishes with his county commission, but he's also taken big steps into regional cooperation and getting Macomb County to become a player in Southeast Michigan. That's where we're getting started tonight. And joining me as always are My Week contributors Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press, gentlemen, and with us at the big table, Macomb County Executive. Executive Mark Hackle. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's get started. In just a couple of weeks, you're going to be doing a state of the county. So what is the state of Macomb County right well, now? Well, I think just to kind of give you a little glimpse of it, it's pretty exciting if you think about it. The question is, this new form of government, is it working? And uh, what they asked for is a more efficient, effective, and ethical form of government. And what we're really going to do is kind of get people to understand uh, what's been happening. Probably the easiest way of explaining it, because people are always questioning about the budget, the national budget, state budget. But if you look at Macomb County's budget, and over the last two years, really three years, because we had to deal with a budget that we were um, given when we first got into office in 2011, in a three-year process or budgeting cycle that we've had to deal with, we've had to close a $52 million budget gap. We did that without any gimmicks, without any layoffs, and now not only have we closed that gap, we have a $35 million surplus for the county itself. So there's been a lot of remarkable things that have been done with the budget alone, and we've given that AAA bond rating, uh, much like our counterparts next door to us in, in Oakland County. So financially, the county is extremely stable, and we're seeing a lot of growth as far as you know population growth as well as investment growth in Macomb County. There's a lot of good that's happening, and we're going to explain that in more detail at this stage. Well, Mark, you're still going through a good deal of growing pains with this new charter. Not everybody is in <laughs> agreement on the powers the charter gives you, the parter, powers it assigns to the county commission. How does that all get get worked out? Is that ultimately a court, a judge is going to decide who, who has what authority in Macomb County? And that's, I think, where we're going to probably end up, and that's unfortunate. I mean, the reality is, as you stop and look at what was just ruled at in the appellate court, uh, basically the decision in the appellate court was that the board's role was very passive when it comes to contracting. In fact, that's the in their language. It gave a tremendous amount of responsibility to the executive, which is what we were trying to tell them to begin with, that the contracting starts with the executive. We decide what contracts go forward. They get to take a look at those contracts and uh, either vote them up or vote them down. They can't change the terms of those contracts. So in the process, uh, the question we had was when they added a contracting policy to the county, the courts did not rule the wisdom of that contracting policy. And in each one of your papers, uh, you'll find that the board was very adamant. It's only about a $35,000 threshold, which is what we agreed to to begin with. But that's not what the contracting policy mm -hmm. says. But we're going to take them at their word that that's all they're referring to. Because if it goes beyond that, Nolan, uh, Steve, i got to tell you, the biggest concern we're going to have is that's going to increase cost. Why? For somebody to deal with uh, managing the contracts within the county government to go beyond what they've ever done before, uh, that's going to take quite a quite a staffing to do what that contracting policy says. So we're going to take them at their word, and we're satisfied with the court decision, giving us the responsibility, and uh, their role is more passive in just saying yes or no. We, uh, we agree with the contract, and it meets all the criteria. Some of the the tension between you and the commission. Sort of so sorted itself out in the elections uh, recently, right? When we had uh, people, uh, I think, who are a little more uh, uh, on your side uh, on this issue uh, get onto the commission, right? Well, we'll see. Again, you always have that. Uh, again, um, I think it's more of a coordinated effort on behalf of the board versus the executive because they want more responsibility. Uh, the charter is going to be the question. The key is, and we've been arguing the Constitution for hundreds of years now, and uh, I think we're going to still have those issues <laughs> when it comes to the charter for Macomb County. If you look at the amendments in Oak or Wayne County to their charter, uh, it's been a continuous process. So there's probably going to be those things put into play, but the question I have is, you know what? The responsibility of executive, without question, is raising the profile of county marketing, dealing with economic development, and preparing a budget. And in the three-year budget process that we've dealt with, I mean, it's pretty remarkable, and I think uh, it stands for itself. This new form of government is working because we've got a balanced budget with a tremendous surplus uh, going forward within the, within the county government. Do you think you've been able to elevate the profile of the county and kind of participate in that regional cooperation? I, without question, we have, and uh, how so? When you look at it, Macomb County has really never defined itself. We've had other people define us, and so we had to do is look at what we have as far as our assets, whether it's defense, automotive, advanced manufacturing, take a look at our Blue Economy initiative that we're putting forward. We've never done that. We've never looked at the county, at the 27 municipalities that make up those municipalities and say, we need to get out there, understand it, brand it, and now get out there and market it. And we're coming up with a very unique way, much like Oakland County when they talk about Medical Main Street, mm -hmm. Automation Alley, look at the state of Michigan, pure Michigan branding. Macomb has never done that. We've never weighed in on it. So we've come up with our, our own branding campaign, if you will, and make Macomb your home. Very unique, very creative, on less than a $20,000 or $20,000 budget in our, our planning department to move forward. We've been able to work with the business sector to try to help us engage in that and uh, continue to raise that profile. In a very short period of time, it's really taken on uh, a 
a, I think, a whole new look for the county. Well, only a handful of counties in Michigan have uh, county executives and have this form of government. Both of your neighbors do, Wayne and Oakland. As you look out, which one would you have, Oak, have Macomb County emulate? Well, I think with our budgeting practices and our financing practices, no question we're emulating that of Oakland County. And I'm very fortunate. Uh, when I first decided to run for the office, I had a lot of dialogue with Brooks Patterson and his staff, in particular Bob Datto. The person we brought on as our financial director, I had asked him to go stand o over uh, in Oakland County and work with uh, Bob Datto to kind of get a feel for what they do. And now we have very similar financing, uh, uh, I guess our, our budgeting practices as Oakland County and a three-year projection. We have finally, within the county, are looking at a budget that we just put forward to the Board of Commissioners, which they're not arguing about the budget itself. Everybody understands there's good work that has been done on behalf of the county-wide, the department heads, and even the employee groups with concessions to balance that budget. There's no dialogue about that. The question we're running into right now is, who controls the line items? Boy, I'll tell you what, the federal government of the state of Michigan would, would be glad to be worried about that problem as opposed to the budget itself sure. being in a deficit. We no longer have a deficit. We're not running deficit budgets. And it's because we're, we're emulating, I think, uh, what they're doing in Oakland County. And the AAA bond rating, as I mentioned, we're sharing with, uh, with Oakland County as well. So I, I think there's a lot to be said about you know that partnership and that regional cooperation that goes beyond just what assets do they have that add value to what we have in Macomb County, but what assets do they have and how are they managing their affairs that we might want to emulate and we might want to uh, take on as well. I know that uh, one of the things you're really concentrating on is the blue economy, so to speak, uh, taking advantage of the, the, the water. Uh, that you have access to out there mm -hmm. in, in Macomb. How's that, how's that working out? We have taken it for granted for so long because it's there, 31 and a half miles of coastline, over 40 miles of, uh, of a river called uh, the Clinton River. And uh, oftentimes you only hear about it when they have, you know, a, 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 what they call a significant event where there's rain and sometimes the, uh, the sewage that will be discharged into the river causing a concern for the lake itself. The lake is a basin. Um, it is not one of the Great Lakes, but it is our Great Lake. And uh, what we have come to recognize, it is the busiest freshwater lake in the entire country during the summer months. What a tremendous asset for us, 31 and a half miles of coastline. How do we redefine that? How do we get people to see that, you know what, this is going to be something that can help us with an economy, but more importantly, a quality of life aspect. That's why people choose to live where they live. live. It's a quality of life. Do they feel comfortable? Are there, are, there, are there things that they can do for recreational activities? In our own backyard, we have one of the greatest lakes and one of the busiest freshwater lakes in the entire world. We are going to continue to promote that, and a lot of things have already been happening as a result of that. Yeah, and you've got a, a lot on your plate in, in the next coming year, and we appreciate you stopping by and filling us in what's going on in Macomb County. Thank you very much, Steve, Nolan, and uh, obviously Christy. I appreciate uh, being here. All right, Mark Hackle, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Now to the Great Lakes battle over a fish. We've all heard of Asian carp. You've probably seen video of them launching out of the water, but the fight to stop them from entering the Great Lakes has become a convoluted skirmish involving the Army Corps of Engineers, big business along the water, environmental groups, and lawmakers. It's all coming to a head in this next year as more activists call for a multi-billion dollar plan that could stop Asian carp and cause massive upheaval in Chicago. Here on the Illinois River, about 30 miles south of Chicago, is ground zero of the latest invasive species debate, whether or not to spend untold billions of dollars separating the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River Basin. We're approaching the electric barriers that have been in place since 2002. Del Wilkins operates a barge business on the Illinois. The fish barriers are working and that the controls weren't being adequate at this far and doing their function to stop the advancement of invasive species, not only from the inland waterways coming into the Great Lakes environment, but also from the Great Lakes environment going into the inland waterways. Frankly, having that technology in place doesn't make me sleep better at night. It's a good interim solution. It does a good job of repelling fish, but we're, we need something in the Great Lakes that we can bank on for generations to come. And I'm banking on the separation of the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River. Debate over building a physical barrier which would interrupt commercial barge traffic started mainly because of this. Asian carp, the frenetic flying poster fish for all invasive species on a seeming quest to scare anyone who encounters them out of their wits, if not their boats. They're a real danger. These are big fish. These are, are uh, oftentimes 60 pound fish and there have been some, some scary and unfortunate instances where they've hit people, uh, broken bones, knocked people unconscious. As dangerous and scary as Asian carp can be above the water surface, they're even more devastating beneath it. Underneath the water, Asian carp are great at eating. They can scoop 
up to 20% of their body weight out of the water per day, and what they do is they eat right at the base of the food web. It's the fear of Asian carp's next destination that has galvanized advocates for separation. They're swimming north towards the Great Lakes through the Mississippi River, the Illinois River, and they're coming very close to us here in Chicago. And it is in Chicago where the proponents of separation would like this fish story to take a sharp turn, literally at the convergence of the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. It used to be that water flowed from the Chicago area into Lake Michigan. At around the turn of the 20th century, around 1900, the water was reversed so that now Lake Michigan drains into the Chicago River down to the Mississippi. At the time, the reversal of the Chicago River, still considered one of the greatest engineering feats in American history, was necessary for a very good reason. To protect the drinking water supply for the city of Chicago. It used to be that their waste was all flushed into Lake Michigan. Well, they wanted to separate their waste from their drinking water for obvious health reasons. And, um, and so the river was reversed. So now you've got this free-flowing canal between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. Great for getting rid of Chicago's waste, great for transportation in the 19th century, but it's also opened up this highway for Asian carp to move up the Illinois River toward Lake Michigan. So the idea is to build a permanent barrier to separate, to restore the natural divide, the natural watershed divide that existed uh, prior to the 1900s. For its advocates, the barrier would not only solve the invasive species problem, but also provide an opportunity to focus on improving the Chicago waterway itself. It is not a modern waterway. It is not a modern transportation system. What we're talking about with this idea of a physical barrier is rethinking Chicago's waterway, modernizing it. Increased property values, clean water, better recreation, more people on the river, and yes, grow commercial transportation in a way that makes sense for Illinois and Chicago. We always need people who want to look forward and um, there's absolutely no reason for us not to do so. Kay Nelson represents an array of industries in the state of Indiana and has been engaged in Great Lakes issues for over 30 years. My concern is that I've expressed multiple times in settings is that the general public has the impression that this is the fast fix to prevent the Asian carp from migrating into the Great Lakes. And it's not something that's going to happen within the next 18 to 24 months. And other critical factors need to be considered before any barrier can become a reality, such as now dumping the treated wastewater and the combined sewer overflow discharges back into Lake Michigan, where Chicago residents get their drinking water. Meanwhile, Dell Wilkins and thousands of others who work along the Chicago Waterway are focused on making a living right now. If we shut down locks or we separate a system, you know, we're forced to have to, to shut down our, our operations. Because if we shut down our operations, I mean, we, we're putting people out of work and we're losing jobs. We move coal, petroleum products, chemical industry products, road salt, ice control salt, sand, gravels cement, steel, and steel byproducts. And right now we're moving upwards of 25 to 30 million tons annually within the greater Chicago land area. There's $16 billion worth of product that go through the waterway system. Mark Beal represents the chemical industry in Illinois and is also chairman of Unlock Our Jobs, a group focused on keeping the Chicago waterway system open. The folks who depend on the waterway system don't want the Asian carp in the Great Lakes. I mean, that's the last thing in the world we want. We want to be part of the solution. Um, what we have said is we think there's a lot of ways to solve this issue short of separating the, the, the waterway system so that it, you, know, you, you, you cause, cause economic harm to those folks that depend on it. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers is expected to give their recommendation by January of 2014. Then it's up to Congress to decide what kind of project that they want to embark on to keep the carp out. But it really kind of starts the conversation of the environment and politics. And will people buy into a massive project like this that would cost billions and billions of dollars, an infrastructure project that doesn't affect everyone around the country, but people in the Great Lakes area are very passionate about because of the 
possibility of Asian carp decimating the Great Lakes environment. And will it work? Do we have that much time? Do we have time for the bureaucrats um, and the politicians to go through this process? Or by 2014, will these Asian carp be, you know, having martinis at the yacht club on um, Mackinac Island? We, we hope that they won't, but I think that's also been a lot of the criticism with the Army Corps is they keep trying to speed up the studies. And I know lawmakers here in Michigan have been on them to say, you've got you've to come to the table a little bit sooner. But it kind of does the, beg the bigger question of politics and the environment. It was nowhere during the presidential campaign. Right. It was no nowhere one was during talking that. about yeah. the Great Lakes. And one of our. Might have won Michigan if you had bring, <laughs> brought up. If Romney had brought up Asian carp during the debate. Well, you yeah. never know. Well, I mean, the other problem that we have uh, right now in Michigan is that our congressional delegation is not unified on this issue. You do have some really great, uh, strong advocates uh, among the delegation, but but uh, Beneshek, who is the uh, the representative for the, the the first district, which is the UP and the the northern end of the uh, lower peninsula, uh, wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, have uh, put the Great Lakes in the into the compact. He wouldn't have uh, elevated them to the status that the Chesapeake Bay has at the federal level, which would provide a lot more funding and protection for the lakes. Uh, he represents the the district that touches three of the five uh, Great Lakes and has not really assumed that kind of leadership, at least in his first term. He didn't. Yeah, um, but I mean, there's and there are other issues, obviously, that he's concerned about beyond the Asian carp. It's the sure. the loss of state control over the lakes, the possibility of future water diversions that could hurt Michigan well, sure. economically. I mean, you know, there are a lot of issues beyond Asian carp, but obviously uh, commercial and recreational fishing, big, huge industries in Michigan. I, and has anyone determined whether these carp can live in a deep cold water lake environment? They've been in river systems yeah. so far. Do they, we know? They can. They've determined that, that they can. That they could obviously they would make their way through Lake Michigan first and Lake Huron, and they would they would reach Superior, uh, you know, yeah. last. But they would thrive, and especially looking also at Lake Erie, which is a very right. shallow and warm environment as well. And that there was some <laughs> eDNA of environmental DNA of Asian carp found. I'll tell you that the protection that has been uh, put in place for the Chesapeake Bay is what we want uh, for the Great Lakes here. It is. It has made a phenomenal difference uh, in a water system there that was that was badly polluted. That was also facing uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems. The same kind of problems that we have now. Things are going in the right direction there, and and if we can get that kind of uh, uh, sort of set aside for the Great Lakes, I, I think the control issue you you do want to maintain maintain control and not have water diversions other places, but but you want it you want people to think of this as a national treasure the way people think mm -hmm. of the Chesapeake. And it certainly yeah. is, but you you know you do have to be mindful that it is also a state resource. It's ours, and right? A huge a huge asset for the people of Michigan, you don't want to see it piped down to Arizona Absolutely not. to allow our, our <laughs> people and our industries to go down there. But under the hashtag, Christy will eat anything, you've actually dined <laughs> on <laughs> Asian carp. Uh, I don't you? think there's a hashtag That's like gross. that that exists, but I have uh, had Asian carp. And tell it's, us about it's, it. It's okay. I mean, it's really bony. It's not the greatest fish in the world. I think when you put breading and fry anything, you can make it kind of taste okay. <laughs> so but is there any I'm commercial not a fan. use for this fish? You know what? Not right now that they're talking about that would outweigh what could happen, potentially happen to the Great Lakes. So it's something that we're definitely going to be watching.